So welcome everybody. And tonight's the last night of the uh, winter lectures. I think most of you guys attended a fair number of the lectures. Is that right? Oh, no, I no. This is your first one. Yep. yep. You were at yeah, least one or two. Yeah. The one. yeah. So you guys have been to yeah, right, every one. Yeah. So the the uh, what I'd like to do towards the end is just have a chat about the winter lectures, how they went, what was good about them, what you liked about them, and then thinking about uh, next year's series. Uh, and the other thing is to is to look at the um, coaching week, which will be which, um, I think starting the 27th of December through about the 1st of January at Wakery, uh, which is a great, you know, it, we'll have summer by then, it'll be warm, it'll be nice, <laughs> cumulus, and, really? and so on, so you can look forward to that. Yeah, so I'd like to talk a little bit about that to see who, who's planning on going to that, if you're going to better go, and then what your expectations of that thing are and what we should be trying to focus on. So I'm after a little bit of input uh, at the end. Um, but before then, I introduce uh, Frank Johan, who everybody here knows, I think. Uh, Frank, I'll get you to give a, a bit of a summary of your, your background and explaining why on earth you are talking about wave and ridge and oxygen, etc. So why you? And um, we look forward to the presentation, so I'll hand over Frank. Hello. Thanks, Terry. The yeah, old news was the name, but just here, a bit of a background on the topics covered tonight. I'll, I'll, first off, I'll start with the oxygen systems. On the uh, uh, Adelaide Soaring Club's oxygen office, I've been that since the start of doing it. Actually, I've got the, the whole uh, show running as far as the club oxygen systems go before that we never had any and the sort of comment was when I was looking into doing it, oh dangerous, oh we don't want to do that because there's a guy that blew himself up in a Cessna over Adelaide Hills uh, 40 odd years ago or something like that and, saw that. and uh, he had a makeshift oxygen system he put in a plane and went up and turned it on and it went bang. So any time somebody, you know, you made oh oxygen bang. But it's a lot of, it's a bit of, like anything, you know, otherwise you'd say, what do you want to fly a glider for? Oh, isn't that dangerous? It's a bit of not really knowing about what you're talking about, making comments. So anything done safely can be done safely. It's just a case of, or generally, sort of thing, you know, walking on top of razor blades and the right way up isn't, I wouldn't do that sort of thing more than else, but uh, you probably could do it, but. I'm not here to talk about that anyway. Um, yeah, so that's that's a bit of background, a little bit of the oxygen side of things. Uh, and uh, with the wave, um, yeah, I have, I've had an interest in that for a, a long time and you know, going to various sort of wave camps and things and introducing a lot of other people into the wave flying and uh, from doing inside the cockpit coaching and training to even remote control uh, radio controlled uh, coaching to other pilots while I've been up there, they've seen them struggle down below and give them a few instructions on what to do and they're in the wave sort of thing so uh, it's a case of a little bit of information like this uh, will help cover the, the, the gaps. Uh, there's a lot of safety aspects, other safety aspects involved in, in both of these topics, I'm not really going to cover over those ones as well, there's too much as such to really give any one subject, even of a night time, uh, enough time for it and I'll probably put a lot of people to sleep after a while, but it's just to give you an insight, you can do some more homework with it, and, and but at least give you some sort of an understanding when you're using or well, involved in these particular activities. So um, I probably uh, might see about getting into it now, I suppose that, you know, if anyone's got any questions as we go along please let me know them. The initial focus I'll go on is in the oxygen systems. So I'll just open a... So uh, Frank, is there, a, <laughs> is, there, is there a definite um, break in your presentation? Is there a good time where people can stretch the Yeah, well, what, what, we'll, what we'll do is I'll, I'll do the oxy to start with. Probably do some of the wave presentation and then we'll, we'll have a stop. Yep. Maybe somebody or if somebody wants to yep. let, I'll take your watch off and I can put it down, it makes it easy to see what's going on time wise. Um, I usually get myself like a little cooking timer sort of thing. But um, 
you know, I'm sort of thinking about half an hour, but that max will go on the oxy and the rest of it will spend on that, and then towards the end we'll, yeah. we'll put some time into the coaching week. Right. Um, yeah, so that's the shot of myself. I was flying at Bunyan, you can see above the, the clouds a bit there. Um, I had some other shots. Uh, you know, I could probably even find them. Is that a smile, Frank? <laughs> sort of kind of smiling, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the strap of your hat slipped up, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got the oxy cannula on. Um, so, yeah, about sort of probably 12,000 feet in waves at that, that stage. So, so we're going into a sort of oxy system, bouncing into the bit of wave motion. <laughs> and that's maybe anyway, you all know me, so... Rightio, why is supplementary oxygen needed for higher altitudes? Sea level, or actually anywhere within the atmosphere, we've got 21% oxygen composition, or pretty well, it's close at 21 point whatever percent, of the, of the atmosphere consists of oxygen. And then as, the, as we go higher, uh, the air pressure reduces, we increase in altitude. There's the same percentage of oxygen but the, what we call the partial pressure of oxygen reduces the same amount that the air pressure reduces. I, I have not the tables and that sort of stuff of, uh, of um, you know, what pressures you get at different altitudes and that sort of thing, but roughly about 18,000 feet is pretty close to being half an atmosphere. So instead of having, uh, like at sea level, we've got, let's say, a partial pressure of 0.21 uh, of oxygen, then you've got at uh, what, 21%, then it's sort of effectively at like 18,000 feet, you've got 10.5%. It's roughly sort of half that pressure. The same proportions are there, but the pressure's less. And we need enough pressure of oxygen to get into your lungs and into your body. If you don't have enough, your body can't absorb it. Um, it you can't go and double your lung size that doesn't happen, we've got a fixed lung capacity, so we've got to work with that. Um, these people that live, you know, little Sherpas and all that sort of stuff, they're used to high altitude stuff, their bodies are, you know, weird sort of things happen with their blood and stuff like that, so they can actually function at high altitudes when we, we can't. But anyway, none of us are Sherpas, so you're going to have to do something like this. Plus it's a regulation. Uh, you know, the, the lack of oxygen is called hypoxia. Whenever we go 10,000 unpressurised aircraft, supplementary oxygen is legally required in Australia. And if you do any badge or record over 10,000, your OO is really obliged to know that you've had oxygen in the glider. Whether you've used it or not, that's another thing. But if you've got it and you haven't used it, you're pretty dumb. So. Uh, you're really not going to perform as well, but if you don't have an oxy system in the glider, they'd say, no, sorry, but even before the flight, so look, you really can't do that flight, don't waste your time. Uh, certainly not, go if, you, if you went below 10,000 feet and did your distance, that's fine, but if you're going over 10,000 feet, if you don't have oxy, technically cannot claim it. That's their job to make sure, uh, I'm pretty certain that, that, that's the rule, Mandy, yeah, yep. she's nodding her head there, yep. so. So, um, as far as what the ASC's fleet goes, the single seaters, the discus have got the oxygen capable, or they'll, they will have the new cylinders shortly, change them. So, how do we cover it? We need a supplementary oxygen system within the glider. Uh, there's a lot of aspects involved in it. I'm not going to cover all the, the details now, and it's not in the scope of this presentation. So, what I've got here, this oxygen system, that's out of a uh, glider that Juliana and I have got. Firstly, all the, the bits and pieces here. Okay. Let's move along here. We've got cylinder, and there's a high pressure, or well, firstly, the, the cylinder itself that stores the, the gas in it. The valve that turns, allows you to turn the gas flow on and off. The high pressure line, which is at the same pressure as the is in the cylinder, and there's a high pressure regulator on here with a gauge on there that shows you what the cylinder content is. And frankly, obviously, the cylinders are always coloured white, is that? Uh, no. Correct. 
Uh, they can be different colours. This happens to be the colour that they use in Germany, but uh, I've had I've got an older version of this one. It's a blue cylinder. I don't know, go figure. It had blue with a little bit of white in there. The medical cylinders that they use here, I'm not sure what they're doing now. They used to have them black with some white and all sorts of different things, but uh, the club ones that we're going to have for the ASC will be basically that same style of cylinder mm -hmm. on there. So there won't be any other gases in there. Is it liquid in there or is it gas? Well, it's, it's gas. It's gas if you have um, liquid oxygen, it's actually at a lower pressure but it's continuously venting because it needs to vent to keep the cryogenics down at the right temperatures because you can't store liquid oxygen at room temperature. It's past the critical point of the gas. It's a bit complicated to describe it, but it's just it's unstable there. It won't, it won't stay there. Yeah. You'd have to have such high pressures and things it starts getting really seriously scary country then so but I think it's past the critical point of the the gas it, it can only stay as a gas at, at, at room temperature so yeah, sure. so it's I'm not sure the temperature at minus 200 something odd degrees it's it's pretty cold stuff when it's at, at you know atmospheric uh, pressure or not atmospheric pressure is probably there There's, they have it slightly they have it above atmospheric pressure but it's still very cold but it's continuously venting mm -hmm. They only use them on military aircraft, and I think the Perlin they used it on there for the Perlin One project had a liquid oxygen cylinders in the back of it. Had a DG five hundred five M motor glider. They took the engine out and put li liquid oxygen cylinders in the back of the of the glider. No, already can send the egret that did all the high altitude fifty thousand feet flying and had liquid oxygen in. Yeah, and they just had the big solids. They just contained that. Mm. They, they just couldn't carry the capacity, it wasn't liquid. Yeah, and you, I mean that, that stuff, they're, they're doing serious, seriously high altitude stuff, they've got to have all that gear in there. And pressure suits. Well, yeah. I can take note of because it's not medical oxygen. It's just no, this, it's this, just this oxygen as well, that, yeah that's the other thing I haven't got on the thing there, is the oxygen that we're using is, uh, there's two main different gas codes that we use, is either gas code 420 or 430. And actually the stuff that we get these filled from will be 430 gas coats is aviators dry breathing. And that's what Mark Morgan, he gets that stuff from their suppliers at, at that that's, uh, specification. But what I've got is a short line in between that red one is the um, reduced pressure that comes out of the high pressure regulator. And that's about uh, 15, 20 PSI pressure. And after that, the other side is the outlet that goes to your cannula. And so, or just sort of, might be easy to see. You can come up afterwards and have a look and just have, just get a bit of a feel. It's a generalisation. And then this other end here, that loose little bit there, that goes into your cannula that you stick on your schnoz. Um, you can use masks, but they're not as efficient as using the cannula. And I find it's more convenient using the cannula on there. So, um, when you're supposed to use a mask above 18 and a half, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But well, I've, I've, I've used myself the pulse oximeter on there, and I find the biggest effect I find is how you breathe. I've been clinically hypoxic at four and a half thousand feet without oxygen, I've just been shallow breathing take a few deep breaths but not rapid breathing but good deep breaths and go deep down into your lungs and all of a sudden that's oxygen saturation went from 88%, 87% up to 98, 99%. I just wasn't concentrating on the breathing, I was just probably that relaxed in the thermal was just sort of you know, too, too relaxed so and even at higher altitudes at 18,000 feet with the cannula it was going off and I wasn't breathing right now, breathe properly and all of a sudden it's up there, you know, 98, 99% oxygen saturation level. So it's, your breathing has got a lot to do with it. This actually taught me a lot about breathing. Sorry, what is that? That's a pulse oximeter. Okay. You're going to cover that later? Or? Yeah, we'll, we'll have a little bit of a look see on, on that one. But we'll just sort of keep uh, going through bits and pieces there. That, so this is the EDS unit, the little box there. 
and that's probably the most popular type of oxygen system that people are using now. Not necessarily the cheapest, but it's not necessarily all anywhere near the most expensive. You can get um, other types of systems, but we won't really cover it here. So they're, they're, they're pretty rare to other so types of systems. Does that thing know your altitude, or do you have to tell it? It, it knows it's got a pressure transducer in there, so it knows what altitude you're at. It does auto correction for altitude. Yeah. So you just turn it on largely, and it looks out for itself. Figures it out itself. It gives you the right level of oxygen. You can either put it on it. Uh, 5,000 feet or 10,000 feet, and if you just got clean your arm, it'll turn itself on when you get to those eyes. Mm -hmm. okay. Close enough to so, yeah. you so if you got your if you got your clean your in, all of a sudden it'll just start working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can turn it on it, put it on the ground if you want. And mm -hmm. Once you get to 10,000 feet or 5,000 feet, we'll just start kicking in. Okay. Yeah, that thing about. So we've had a look at the basic load components: the cylinder, the high pressure regulator. Uh, the low pressure re regulator delivery system or fly meter, in this case that particular item there is, is this EDS unit. There are other types that are like a, a little float valve, you've got a needle valve in there and, and you can adjust the oxygen rate that you're using and it's calibrated to particular altitudes. So that requires manual intervention on adjusting that flow rate and depending on whether you're using a cannula or, or a mask and that sort of thing. We used to have those uh, an AFC system, but we got rid of them. They're a lot more thirsty on oxygen, whereas these are very efficient. Um, the various delivery tubes and hoses and cannulas. Um, you know, this, this, I've got two different types of cannula here. Actually, I'll put this thing on. Just what's an EDS system worth? Kind of uh, I think those boxes here they're worth probably about. Seven hundred dollars or something like that, the US. Uh, the regulator is about probably one hundred and fifty bucks or something like that. You can you can buy kits, I think, for hundred seven hundred and fifty dollars, or you, if you buy more of a kit, it actually works out being more cost effective. But the way to put these ones on, you make sure there's prongs on there, and there's a curve, and there's a little flap down on there as well. If you put it on like that with the flap upwards, it's the wrong way around. You need to have the flap down and the prongs curving down because you. The prongs are sort of shaped like that because your, your cavity within your nose goes down and in. So you want the oxygen to go in the direction it's going to flow. So to put it on, make sure you've got both prong in each nostril around each ear and then you zip that up the front there. I prefer doing it that way, not around behind the neck because you can see it, adjust it. And when you're turning around looking out, this isn't flabbing around behind you and you, you always have to consistently keep just checking this and giving it a, a nip up. And the other thing I like about wearing it around the ear like this, when it's going, you can hear a pssst, pssst, pssst. That sound is good. If you don't hear that, something's wrong. You know that's another good way of checking that your oxygen system's activated and going. Um, there's a different type of cannula there as well, I've got, which is a flare tip cannula and it, uh, if, if you're, if you, the best thing before you ever use one of these things is actually connect it up, hook it up to the unit, you can run it on the end mode which is, comes at sea level, if it doesn't activate while you're breathing, if you haven't got one of these what they call a flare tip cannula, you can put actually put a bit of tape around the tip, make sure you don't block the end off, but around the actual prong itself, and you can expand it until the point that it starts tripping because it gives you greater surface area and a greater pressure drop when you breathe in. So it triggers the, the, uh, the unit can detect the pressure change. So you get them from the club, you said? Oh, the, the yes, the cannula's the from the club. How much are they? Uh, I think with the connector, I think 15 bucks or something like that. So just see the office, let them know. And that in there, actually just you just get that in, push it in, and there's a, just a, a partial clockwise click and turn. It's just a, you, you hear it click into place. You can have a look at these afterwards. The only thing is, don't put these ones on, please, because they're my own cannulas, and I don't think you want some of your 
my bits up your nose and vice versa. I think, the, I think so. the second hand cannulas are a little bit cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Frank, also in a, in a twin CD, do you run two cannulas off the one regulator? Or? No, what yeah. we've got with, with our club arrangement, each seat has got one of these EDS units. Right, yeah. So that's the way we've standardised in the club. Yeah. So you'll have your own one, you can control it. Yep. Off the one bottle, off the one regulator, but off from the high pressure, we've got a splitter, mm -hmm. and then it goes into the two low pressure lines, those red ones, one to the back seat, one to the front seat. Yep. And where do you get the oxygen bottle from? They make jewels. You're going for a higher cross country flight. So the, the, at Gawler, we've got those ones, that, uh, they're part of the club. The club's yeah, got yeah, six, six of them. But you know, how do you get hold of one to stick it in the glider to go for a fly? Just have to see you. Do you yeah, see generally time? it's in there. We'll we'll sort that out as another thing later on. Once yeah, it's, okay. once we've got the because we're having new mounts made up. Brian's arranging some mounts for the DGs in the first instance, plus the discus. Once that's done, I'll give everyone. We'll go through a series of briefings on how to do that. But we'll do that as a scope of a different at okay. a different time. Sure. Um, okay, less popular types, the ex-military systems, um, there's demand systems, there's two different styles of demand, uh, basically um, like they're a mask that just goes all over your face and they can use up to 100% oxygen flow in there, there's a uh, what they call diluted demand which will adjust the oxygen rate based on altitude and then there's a pressure demand which gives you pressurised oxygen. I don't know if you go up high, I think you go up to about 42,000 feet supposedly with a pressure demand system. They're like rocking horse droppings and uh, really, really expensive and even more so expensive to get serviced if you can even find the right people to service them. So basically, I, would, I wouldn't buy that, you know. Does Rick Angie use one of those? Um, he knows of somebody that's got one, but I don't think they can get it serviced. So that's, and the, they're the guys that are they're in the know and doing that sort of stuff. So, um, but for well, there's also a constant flow system which we used to use before. Some people call these constant flow as well. I don't know how. Jury's out for me whether you actually call them a constant flow because they're not really a constant flow. They they're a demand system, but they. Um, anyway, yeah. It's, um, you got any ballpark figures for the number of hours of use you get out of one of those cylinders? It depends on how high you are. Yeah, sure. And how and, and also your breathing rate. rate. If you if you really yeah, like but that, it'll go. It's it's looking at the cycle times, and it'll be going. And the higher you go, like at say ten thousand feet, you might get one burst every two or three breaths. And then as you get a little bit higher again, it'll go every breath. And then you go higher again, it'll do longer cycles every breath. So the higher you go, you get some psst, psst. Sometimes it'll just be psst, psst. Is it multiple flights? Is it? Oh, yeah. I've got out of this, hours? Is it out of this cylinder, hours? I've probably got the equivalent of uh, probably getting three diamond height climbs in multiples of hours of flying probably you know you do seven eight you know, maybe nine hours worth of flying doing diamond heights and thermal flying you can you can virtually go to a whole summer you know as a in a private aircraft on one of those cylinders right. okay. so they're, they're very very efficient compared to the same size cylinder using the an old-fashioned style constant flow system, you'd be lucky to do a You can do a diamond height climb in a cylinder, but you'd empty it right out. That's the difference. You can, yeah, I used to have a, I've still got a, a constant flow system and I pretty well have to, if I had a, a long flight, a long cross country flight, the bottle would be pretty well empty by the time I finished. Right. And with this, I'm probably doing, I can do a whole competition, so six to 12 flights, um, and the oxygen bottle still got oxygen in it at the end with the, with the EDS system. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing is like using masks to eat, drink, talk, it's not as uh, user friendly as using a cannula and for most of the flying the cannula is great, you can 
talk on the radio, you can have something to eat and drink. I mean, you've got this thing that's stuck in your nose, but you know, after all, you, get, you actually get used to it, it doesn't bother you. You really don't even notice it well, while you're flying, mm. especially getting up there high and whizzing along and having fun. Uh, yeah, you're certainly having a bit of fun, and we'll just we'll keep moving along with this. So, yeah, this I find these systems they're, they're good for thermal and even wave up to 25,000 feet. Um, uh, civilian systems, um, yeah, the old constant flow, there's a Nelson and Aerox system. I, I won't bother about those ones here now. I don't think uh, anyone's really worrying about using them. They're a bit cheaper than these, but in the long run, for convenience, the, I think the EDS is just my personal view, and I think a lot of people think they're the, the best thing since sliced bread as far as oxygen goes. So if you're going for records, different stuff, but you'll have to do your own homework on that because that's out of the realm of uh, what, what we're going to look at here. Um, so with EDS system use or any, any time of box oxygen system, you need to how to you have to understand how to use it, uh, be familiar with its operation. It is your life support at and you know at altitude, especially once you get you know altitudes like twenty thousand feet plus. That's starting to get into very fairly serious sort of country up there. You can uh, at twenty five thousand feet if you lost your oxygen, your useful consciousness is in a matter of you know, minutes up there. So you make sure, while they're up there, I'm doing a lot of checks. And one of my main checks is, is the damn thing still working? You know, I'm looking at my contents gauge. Have I, you know, I've got plenty of oxy in it, that's fine. It's going, pss, 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 all the light sort of lights are flashing and all that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing is, well, your batteries, because these things are battery operated. Um, I use uh, the good uh, quality lithium batteries. Uh, you know, get the Energizer ones, or use those ones. They're apparently, it says on the packet, they're rated to minus 40. If you see on the pack, um, they, and I also change them manually. So if I go to a wave camp, chuck the old ones out, however of much use I've used them, put a new set in and uh, you're good to go then. But um, I had last summer, uh, I was official observer for a pilot and went out to do a cross country of the oxygen system and the glider and the EDS unit was flat. And I said to him, hey, that unit's flat. So I got a, a new set of batteries for him. He did, wasn't aware how the system worked. He just went in there and plugged it in, turned it on, but it wasn't working. So it wouldn't have been any and good for them, yeah. So it's again important to understand how the how the thing works. It's just, it's just two double A's, isn't it? Yeah, two the two double A batteries. But I, yeah, I prefer using the lithiums. I mean, you do when you when you start it up, it does a. We'll, we'll probably just have a quick look around afterwards. We can all come up here and have a look. It does a boot up cycle. And if you don't hear that sort of sound when it, when you turn it on, it's flat. Um, the other thing I've got here, uh, it's this one, this is a pulse oximeter and you can get ones that you wear on your finger only and they've got the readout and so forth on, on your finger. Some of you can get put on the ears and stuff like that. I don't like the ones on the fingers just like that because if your hand gets cold, it stops. This I've actually got a mitt. I bought a, a mitt to go with this, actually got two mitts, but the other hand, I'll put this glove on, if I go away flying, my right hand I'll wear that one, left hand I've got a mitt so I can operate the flaps, and then the back of this little cable here plugs into the back of the oximeter units like a watch, and you just wear it on the back of your, your wrist like that, and I'll put my watch on my right arm. And I'll set an alarm on here that when you get 88% oxygen saturation, the alarm goes off. So you hear this dee -dee 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 sort of alarm going off then, and it tells you, hey, do something about it. So usually breathing, just you probably haven't been focusing or concentrating on the breathing, and you've, I've always found I've done that and it's fixed, 
fix that up. Now this thing here, let's see if I can turn it on. Yeah, see, the system will also beep it and hang taking a breath for a while. Yes. Now I've had it when you're flying along and you start breathing through your mouth. Um, yeah. Rather through yeah, your nose. Unfortunately, you know, so pick it up. the other thing I'm losing. Yeah, you, you, you hear an alarm, but that's because you're breathing through your mouth. Mm -hmm. so yeah, three it's three yeah, it's, it's well, I'll, I'll fill around with it afterwards, so I'm yeah. wasting more time on it now. But I think the first time I took it out to use it, first wave camp, it broke. So they're not very good that way, sturdiness. The button in here popped open and I've sort of glued it back again, but now it's gone really sticky. So to turn it on, I've got to undo the screws, pull the back off, get a little screw uh, drive in there, flick the little latch in there and put the back back on again and I can use it. So that's just a voluntary thing that you use. You don't have to wear one of them. No, no, no. You, 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 each, you know, that's that was two hundred and eighty bucks. And I'd say it's a bloody heap of junk. <laughs> no. Apart from what it does, mm -hmm. but I think the quality of these things. There's this is made in China, and I think the Israel, Israelis make some. I don't know how, how much better the Israeli ones are, but I think probably I'd. Uh, uh, if anyone's going to get one. Maybe look at the Israeli ones before you buy a Chinese one because I think the Chinese quality hasn't come up to the the standards you'd expect, sort of thing. You know, it's, I mean, the components in there, I'd say it's only like not even 10 bucks worth of electronic gear, and then somebody's making a moxa on those things. So. Um, I would think it's only the, the guys that are. Uh, planning on a fair amount of time on oxygen yeah. would be using oh. one of those. It's just a check, right? Just a check to make sure that you're getting yeah. enough. If, yeah. if you go on thermal, thermal flying, flying yeah. cross country, no yeah. need to do because you're not really in a serious, um, let's say, life-threatening potential area. Mm. You know, up to 18,000 feet, it's reasonably benign. Mm. And if the oxy system's going, you, even if you're not breathing quite right, uh, you're not going to do um, you know, silly things up there. Anyone smoke at all? Good. Because you're already at 5,000 feet above sea level if you smoke, believe it or not. Equivalent to that. So if you're... That smoking does make you high. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if, if you're at 10,000 feet, <laughs> you're, you're basically the equivalent of being at 15,000 feet. So if you're using the EDS, you'd actually have to use higher oxygen set settings and actually using a pulse oximeter for a smoker would probably be even more so important to use. So, but anyway, nobody smokes, so that's a good reason not to do it. Okay, we'll move along there. Yeah. So otherwise, yeah, there's, wait, there's more, there's quite an involved subject. Uh, just gives you an overview. And with the club, I'll do some more training on this uh, at Adelaide Soaring Club later on. We've also got Graham Parker. He's a, a, by profession, he's a doctor. He's an, actually, he's an anaesthetist. And before he became a doctor and anaesthetist, he was a RAF aviation medicine specialist trainer. So he trained air crews on... Um, aviation medicine including oxygen and, and the like and he does a really good presentation so we'll get into that maybe even for a winter lecture next year could be a topic would it wouldn't hurt doing that it's it's really really good he's a he's an excellent presenter cheers cheers <laughs> um, oxygen. <laughs> yeah, <try out laughs> oxygen. yeah so I'll, I'll produce an updated manual for ASC and yeah, use an oxy even in the two seaters. So, like I'd, I'd suggest, even at Gawler, uh in you know, the 505 or the 1000, if it's a you know, reasonably good day, chuck it in there. You go with the instructor and your coach and go for a bit, bit of a belt up the road, and you can get up to you know, 10,000 feet plus. You you really get to see where these toys can go. So, yeah, I've been uh, oxy officer since early 90s. Um, my first introduction to using EDS was actually on a five-day private course I did with uh, 
Glider Marama in, in 2006. I actually used the old analog system. Brian's got one of those ones as well. I reckon the EDS units. This is the digital one. The earlier version they called the analog units. Whichever way, they're, they're great. The, 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 the digital ones uh, with the batteries go longer. Uh, they use a small, uh, use double A's versus the nine volts. Um, yeah, I was just sold on the concept then, it's just so easy to use. You can you can spend more time as a pilot flying the glider rather than having to worry about mucking around with the system. So, so you can concentrate on doing the flying stuff rather than fiddling bits and get your head out of the cockpit. Um, Is there any stuff like must not do? I've heard if, you, if the oxygen comes out, you know, rural stream of oxygen coming out of the thing and you put it on you know, you direct it on plastic or perspex or whatever. I don't know what it is. It'll set fire to it. It'll catch fire. The, there's, there's risk. Stuff depends like on, that. depends on what, what yeah, the, what, what the material is. But it's mostly like oils and grease and oil, okay. that sort of stuff like that. If you, that can uh, spontaneously ignite. Uh, then, and with high pressure oxygen, like those fittings, there, if I put any amount of grease or something like that and get it up and turn it on, it, it had explode. So you know, we could. Uh, probably have shards of metal going all around this room if we did it, so it wouldn't be such a... So a, they put Vaseline a, on a, the... No, computer. no. Make it turn, like, make it turn. Yeah. No, yeah. no, there's absolutely no lubricants, no... N nothing, it's screen? totally dry. If you can't... Too, yeah. If you can't do it up... Careful with sunscreen. If you can't do it up, go and ask somebody. But, you know, if in doubt, go and ask, rather than, oh, let's just... Try it and see what happens. Because it'll be, it'll, it'll probably be, it'll probably be the last thing you ever do if you do try it. So, you know, just be careful. All those fittings don't get anything on them. Any new connections and stuff. It's like you said with the sunscreen. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just got sunscreen. Don't go and then start playing with your fittings and then go put it on. You know, you just got to be aware of that. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just yes, when, when you when you get a glider ready at the beginning of the day. And you're going to use oxy. Do your oxy stuff, the very first uh, item, and then once the oxygen system sorted out, then sort out the rest of the body because you can have sunscreen on or whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, as far as around here, look, um, you know, sunscreen near the breathing devices. When I did research in the, in the early days about this, um, uh, St John's, I asked them. What do they do with oxygen and, and that sort of stuff, giving it to people, and they just stick it on, regardless. But they said they never had anyone blow up or catch on fire. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, look, it's, you, you hear all sorts of different stories, and it depends on whether it's, it's true or not. I mean, it'd be a good thing myth, myth busters to do and, and you know, see, what see what happens and <laughs> stick oxygen on Buster and you know, warm them up and <laughs> put some, you know, see, supposedly <laughs> some pilot had uh, tooth pa uh, not, uh, um, peanut paste and had that to eat and put an oxy mask on and turned the oxygen on and it caught on fire in his mouth and <laughs> you know, I don't know what's a load of ball and, or, or whether it's real, but yeah. put it this way, I'm not going to find out. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so do you do anything with it when you're doing the DI? Have you got oxygen fitted? Is there? Yeah, is it there's, there's stuff about that. I mean, it's best to get a run through with that, and that's part of the thing we can do some training on yeah, okay. later on. So we'll, we'll, we'll sort that through that. Uh, that's a bit of a missile when you when you crash. So you, yeah. yeah, it you needs to. Where it is. Yeah. It, behind it, your head, it will kill you. There's, there's, a, there's a 15G crash load requirement on the fittings, especially like for, for the oxygen cylinder. It needs to survive a 15G, so it's 15 times the weight of the cylinder. Yeah, it needs to sustain. Because yeah. they figure, I think, much more than that. crash, you're going to be dead anyway. So. Yeah, you're going to be in trouble. So it's, it's you're not going to get killed as a result of the cylinder coming loose and hitting you. Sort of thing. You, something else would happen to you. <laughs> uh, so, any with this any questions so far with about the? Oh, it's really it's just a more of an overview and an introduction about it. Uh, but what uh, what I will do just quickly, uh, I'll see on here is 
you might want to come up and have a bit of a close look. Now there's some buttons on here, and there's a plus and minus button. It's a bit hard to, bit hard to see. I'll well, just turn it on. Did you all hear that? I had a flash and light. I'll just turn it off again. I'll just actually, I'll, I'll unplug it off of here. Now these fittings, of using the club system as well, the cannula's normally got this blue tube that comes out, out of here. Uh, so the cannula then normally plugs into that larger fitting, the 6mm and the 4mm is your high pressure, not the high pressure, medium pressure, or the oxygen supply into it. But we don't go and pull them in and out, because if you yank on that and pull it out, you'll bust the barbs in there, and that, that unit's stuffed and it has to go to the factory and get it fixed. So I'd rather go and use these things, and if they something happens to them, then it doesn't matter, you can toss them away, they're like three bucks uh, US each or something like that, so they're, they're not a lot at all compared to having to replace that. But yeah, so the buttons here, I'll turn that one back on again, the plus. Okay, you hear that? That boot up and it flashes sort of like uh, red, um, sort of yellow and green sort of flashes that goes through. Yeah, oops. Turn it around the wrong way there. Yeah, it's sort of a multicoloured sort of flash that goes through. And so, so the first step's N, that's night mode. And you see there's some placard on here, you've got N, that starts from sea level. There's D5 and D10, which is the cannula setting, starts at, so normally 5,000 or 10,000. And then you've got face mask settings, which are incremental increases in oxygen flow rates. If you're on a cannula as well, you can increase the flow rate. So if you find I'm a bit underdone, I've been a bit active in the cockpit, you know, worrying about fiddling around with stuff and so now that's showing that alarm coming up now is no oxygen because I've got no pressure in here. If I turn this, plug it in, turn it on, it'll probably be satisfied then. So I'll just quickly go and turn it on, slowly open the cylinder up. Yep. That's all right now. And it's the other thing that's probably going off a bit. Ah, I'm not breathing through the. I'm not. I'm not connected. You're dead. I'm, I'm dead. Yeah. So I'm just going to just quickly plug, plug it in. And I'll put this thing on. So there's like an apnea, an apnea alarm in here that says, and you have to breathe through your nose if you've got the cannula. Don't breathe through your mouth. Doesn't work. Uh, I mean, it's, it, yeah, because if you've got your mouth open and you're breathing, see so it stopped. Wow. Mm -hmm. And now, yeah, it's tick. Yeah. Can you hear it? Yeah. Mm. Now, if you can hear it, I can really hear it because it's really around here. Now, if I turn this off, I've got a fair bit of oxygen in that in that line now, actually to bleed to bleed these things. I just go back and forth a few times between off and in, and you can bleed the line out then. So if your high pressure system, your system's pressurised and you want to turn it off, go between. Oops, wrong way. Because each time you go yes. initially in, you can get the. Psh, and again, part of that burn up cycle, you will hear all these sorts of things going on. If it doesn't happen, then it's not working properly. I'll go back there. Yeah, burst there, in. Now if I go D5, that won't work now. But if I'm not breathing through the nose, after a while the apnea alarm will go off. So even if you've got it turned on, you'll hear this thing, dee 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 kept carrying on. It's either better to turn it off, if you're going to spend a long time down low, but you can leave the cannula hooked up, because otherwise if you happen to breathe through your mouth, it's just a pain of this alarm going off. So that'll, that'll go off, and then the other thing, or you know, 5,000, then I'll go uh, 10,000, and then the various face mask settings. See, now the apnea alarm's gone off. So even at D10, see, it shut up now. So it's, so it's satisfied for, through the pressure transducers in here, sensing that I'm breathing. 
So it's actually a good thing, you know, it allowed, it, it's, oi, oi, you know, so first thing, hey, am I breathing through the nose? Have I run out of oxygen? Check the gauge. Yeah, I've got pressure there. Um, might be surprised sometimes when you're flying, all of a sudden that alarm goes off and it means you're not actually breathing. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you're under pressure or whatever you're doing and you, you, get your yeah, you haven't bothered to breathe for a little while. All right, if anyone it's wants to, you know, it's a bit hard to probably pass all this sort of stuff along there, but you can see the contents gauge on here as well. And you can actually see the how to read the gauge. I mean, it might be obvious, but it's not necessarily all that obvious. You can see the, the pressure where it is, know where you start, and how much you're using during the flight. You can have a look and say, no, I've hardly used that. See, the apnea alarm's gone off now. So, turn that one off. So I've got that off. So, yeah, it's, um, it's otherwise, it's quite a quite an easy, a uh, simple system to use compared to using the old. What height do you start using oxygen? Uh, I, I set it usually to, on the D10 setting, so I just put it on that, and it, usually it kicks in about nine. I find about nine and a half thousand. Yeah, I usually turn mine on at about eight. If I'm on the thermal flight, I find that I, I, I notice that I get start getting a bit light. You know, different, different people suffer differently yeah. with uh, hypoxia, and I think I get it. I think I get it quite low. I, I yeah. really notice that when I'm at 10,000 feet, I find that I'm turning in a crappy thermal, thermal going nowhere, and when you've got the oxy, you don't. You know, mm -hmm. just, you just sort of, hypoxia yeah. makes you get a bit like you get stuff when you've been drinking, you know, yeah. so I get a bit slow and a bit, mm. and I find that I sit there in a thermal just turning around, really not not centering, not, not having my mind on the job, and so I usually put it on about eight when I'm... How do you set it for eight? Put it on 5,000 just when I'm... Ah, right. yeah. You get a headache as well, can't you? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. You get a headache? You yeah. Reading, well, time, time. yeah so when, I get to, when I get to about 8,000, I'll have it off and then I'll just turn it on to 5 and then it kicks in. Yeah. Yeah. John Neagle used to say on a long flight coming home, he'd switched on a half an hour before coming home, regardless, just to freshen himself up. He said, mate, a big difference to how you perform coming in at the last bit. Right. Yeah, it looked too. He said, otherwise you get tired and he said, you'll spark it up a bit. We'll give you a boost regardless yeah, of what you can, time, and then with, with that, if you want, you can set it like on the like for your final glide, set it even on the end mode, mm. which gets you down to sea level. So, even using oxygen down to sea level, but the consumption that you're using is not that much. Yeah, right. And if you just feel like, look, I'm, I'm you know, maybe a bit dehydrated, just feel a bit off, mm. off sorts a bit, put it on there, gives you the extra little bit of you know, mental capacity. And just that extra little bit of something there, it's well, it's there anyway. Well, the summer, as you're coming down lower, it does get pretty hot, say a 40 degree day. Yeah. Well, that's pretty warm and put an extra bit of help. So, I, I think what we might do, because we've we sort of had a little bit of a later start, we might probably uh, have the break now and then we'll get into the other part, I think. So, okay. uh, why don't we take what, 10 minutes or something? Yeah. Like that? Uh, at the moment, that's. Uh,